So today, yeah, we're lucky to have uh, John Conley. Um, so he's he got his PhD from uh, Penn State. Uh, and after that, he worked in some industrial labs. He worked at Sharp. Uh, and, and he also worked at uh, JPL for a while. Uh, so he's got some good experience in industry and in government labs. And in 2007, he came to OSU. We we're very lucky to get him to come to the academic side of things. Um, and he's uh, right now the director of the Material Synthesis and Characterization Facility. Um, he's done a lot of uh, great things in the materials world. Um, he's a fellow of the IEEE and the American Vacuum Society, so he can handle your cleaning needs. Uh, that, that's a joke you cannot avoid, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's, uh, uh, you know, done a lot of interesting work um, in, in layer deposition. And I'm not even gonna try to read the title um, of this. Uh, I, I think uh, hopefully its meaning will become apparent by the end of the talk. But uh, you can see here that he, he likes mountains. He might've climbed a couple of these. He likes big things, and but he spends his, his day job is looking at these tiny little things. So let's see what John has to say to us. All right, Alan, thank you for the very, very nice introduction, very flattering. Uh, yeah, it's a very long title, but uh, to tell you today, I'll talk about a little bit about one part of what we do in the lab, and that's looking at uh, energy barrier heights in uh, metal insulator metal devices with internal photo emission. And Alan's right, I do like the mountains. This is a view from a long time ago from the top of South Sister. Uh, you can see uh, Middle Sister, North Sister, uh, Broken Top, uh, Jefferson and Hood in the distance there. Pretty nice day, no fires that day. All right, uh, before I begin, I'd like to first acknowledge uh, collaborators uh, on this work. Uh, most of this work you're gonna look at was uh, lead, led by uh, Melanie Jenkins, who's now at Intel. She did all the IPE measurements. Uh, also Tyler Clark is now at Micron, Dustin Austin now at LAM, uh, Sean Smith now at Sandia, as well as our current student, Connor Holden. Uh, John McGlone is actually now on Semiconductor. He uh, was a student of John Wager, who uh, recently retired. Uh, we've also had on, on some of the uh, uh, ferroelectric hafnium oxide uh, collaborators from Sandia National Labs, including Mike Broombaugh, Sean Smith, Mike Henry, and uh, Davids. And then also uh, Nan Nguyen Nan at NIST and uh, John Illefeld at the University of Virginia. Uh, some of the support for the work came from the NSF Sustainable Center for Materials Chemistry and also Applied Materials. Most of the work was done in my lab, which is, resides in the OSU Material Synthesis and Characterization Lab. As Alan mentioned, I'm director of this lab at uh, Oregon State. It's the only shared use clean room in the uh, openly accessible clean room in the state. And it's also part of this uh, NSF funded National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure. Uh, which we're partners with the University of Washington and uh, Oregon State. So if you need to use facilities, uh, if you're in industry and want to be interested in using facilities, please contact uh, us about that. All right, I'm going to start a little bit, since this is a, kind of a, a tech talk from uh, the EECS, I'll start a little bit with background and motivation, including what my research group focuses on at OSU, which is basically novels materials development for device applications. I'll give some background on ALD and MIM devices and then talk about these energy barriers that are in that long title and also uh, how we measure them with photoelectron spectroscopy or photo emission like spectroscopy. And then I'll talk about some specific results and some interesting materials, some amorphous metals and this uh, new ferroelectric hafnium zirconium oxide. All right, so atomic layer deposition is what we focus on in the group and it's an interesting uh, deposition method. It's a chemical vapor deposition, uh, but instead of having the reaction occurring all the time in the chamber, you split it up into two half reactions and you alternate exposure of the precursors one at a time. And so it relies on self-saturating surface reactions and it gives you a layer by layer deposition. Uh, so what you do is you pulse uh, your reactant, say trimethyl aluminum, it reacts in a single monolayer on the surface. And then after it chemisorbs, uh, no more material can fizzysorb. And when you purge any excess precursor or fizzysorb material on the surface will, will, will go out to the vacuum pump. And then you pump in your oxidizing agent. In this case, you can see it looks like water. Uh, that reacts with the first layer to form a, a nearly complete monolayer material. In practice, it's about a third of a monolayer. And so you just repeat this again and again, and you build up your layer, your material one layer at a time, as opposed to CVD where you control it with a stopwatch and you stop it when you're done. Uh, 
Uh, because of these um, self-saturating reactions, uh, there's a number of advantages that ALD imparts. Uh, first of all, you get atomic scale composition control since you're going layer by layer, and that allows us to deposit uh, fairly complex nanolaminates and doped materials. Uh, also, uh, you get excellent conformality. So um, you get the same thickness no matter what sort of, uh, if, you, if you do your deposition, right, the same thickness on even very deep uh, aspect ratio uh, structures. And that allows us to do conformal coding of even nanostructures. Uh, we did some work with uh, uh, collaborators in wood science where we coded their cellulose nanocrystal aerogels, uh, which is a pretty neat project. All right, so we do a lot of material development uh, with atomic layer deposition, a uh, wide variety of materials. I won't get into the details of any of these, but we do sulfides. Uh, currently, we're working on tungsten disulfide. Uh, a lot of different types of oxides, including T-type semiconducting oxides, nickel oxide, cobalt oxide, as well as conductive oxides, uh, here niobium dope trioxide. And we'll talk about today a lot of insulating oxides like hafnium, zirconium, and so on oxide. And then finally, also conductive materials. Uh, to the first paper on uh, atomic layer deposition of ruthenium using a novel precursor, and also conductive ruthenium oxide. I notice a lot of these are in collaboration with uh, industrial partners, and that's a lot of what my lab likes to do. We like to work on uh, real-world projects, and these materials development, there, you know, aren't just for the sake of developing the materials, but it's directed for device applications. And although we work on TFTs and MOS structures and a number of other things, uh, today I'm going to be talking about a very simple structure: uh, metal insulator, metal devices. And as you can see, that it's fairly simple structure. You got an insulator sandwiched between two metals. But despite its uh, simplicity, it's used in a number of devices, including capacitors, uh, random access memory, uh, these RM you've heard about, uh, hot electron transistors, kind of more of a futuristic device, uh, single electron transistors, tunnel emission cathodes. And today I'll be focusing on MIM diodes. And what's interesting about those is you put a very thin insulator between those and the operation becomes based on tunneling. And so you get the potential for very high speed operation since tunneling is nearly instantaneous. And that opens up applications in uh, IR detection and energy harvesting. A lot of work we've done over the years has focused on uh, these uh, rectifying antenna, the rectenna, uh, where you put this uh, MIM diode in between a bow tie antenna and you're actually able to uh, uh, harvest very low efficiency at present uh, infrared energy, so waste energy and that sort of thing. Uh, the figures of merit for a diode, of course, nonlinearity. And you want for, if you're gonna harvest energy, you want this all to happen at very low bias. But if you look at the structure, this is a band diagram, equilibrium band diagram here. You've got your metal, uh, same metal on both sides. And you see, you've got a symmetric uh, barrier here to conduction. And uh, you can't imagine that you'd get uh, asymmetry out of this device. And so in fact, um, what you have to do is to create asymmetry in these devices. And the most traditional approach is to use different metals on either side. So you use a metal with a larger work function here, metal with a smarter, smaller work function here, and you get a built-in voltage across your device and you get this asymmetric tunnel barrier. And if you apply uh, a negative bias to the top metal, you can directly tunnel through the insulator. However, if you apply a positive bias, you can uh, tunnel through a triangular barrier and get much higher uh, currents that way because now the barrier gets narrower, skinnier and skinnier as you uh, increase the bias. And so this is known as Fowler-Nordheim tunneling. And the asymmetry in these devices is really based on that. So um, asymmetry, again, is the negative current over the positive current. I don't know if I've mentioned that yet. And these barrier heights uh, here on either side are critical in determining, uh, being able to predict the current that's gonna go through the device in the asymmetry. And the devices are limited by um, the uh, the difference in uh, vacuum work function that you can get between metals and also the single dielectric properties. So shown here is a 10 nanometer um, single dielectric aluminum oxide device surrounded by uh, an amorphous metal that I'll talk about in a few minutes and aluminum. Uh, if we go thinner, uh, we can actually improve the uh, turn on voltage of the asymmetry, but not so much the maximum asymmetry. But if we continue to try to make it thinner, uh, it doesn't work so well. Uh, we actually just reduce, as we make it thinner and thinner, we just reduce the asymmetry because you can become dominated by direct tunneling. And so a lot of what we've done is to try to figure out ways to improve asymmetry by uh, engineering that tunnel barrier. And I'll just talk about this a little bit, but by splitting that tunnel barrier into two different dielectrics, uh, we can greatly improve the asymmetry. 
So now when we apply a, uh, notice that um, in this equilibrium band, band diagram, we still have a built-in potential across this because we've got different work functions for the Z can and the aluminum. But we apply a negative bias here. Now we're direct tunneling just through one of the insulators into the conduction band of the other. So we've essentially taken out half of this barrier. And so you get a pretty high current this direction. Whereas under the same magnitude of bias in the uh, opposite polarity, you're still tunneling through both insulators. And so it's easy to visual, visualize the, uh, the asymmetry here. In fact, doing that, we're able to improve um, the asymmetry further with a single layer device. Uh, still critical to this though, is this, uh, these um, energy barriers on either side. By further reducing this energy barrier here, we're able to get even better asymmetry at lower voltages. And that was a, a different project I won't talk about. Uh, so one more thing before we get into these barrier heights, uh, kind of the way, direction we're going now is to using uh, atomic layer deposition to do defect engineering in these devices. So this is a band diagram of aluminum oxide showing the, the band gap between the valence band and the conduction band. And this is a paper that uh, predicted what the energy levels of various transition metal impurities would be. Uh, they would introduce, you know, by disrupting the periodic potential, you introduce levels in the band gap. And we had just developed a process for nickel, and we wanted something that would introduce energy levels near the uh, Fermi level of the aluminum that tie nitride. And so by using ALD, we can deposit a, a thin layer of aluminum oxide, and then just a couple cycles of nickel, just basically introducing an impurity layer, layer in there, and then uh, finish our device. And using ALD, we can put this impurity layer of nickel wherever we want. We can put it near the top, in the middle, near the bottom, or throughout the aluminum oxide dielectric. And what that does is introduces energy levels um, in the gap, in the band gap of the aluminum oxide, pretty much wherever we want spatially as a function of thickness. And then the idea is we can get defect enhanced asymmetry. If we apply, uh, say, a, a negative or positive bias to our aluminum, we can get step tunneling, or not step tunneling, a trap assisted tunneling through the defect level. Whereas under the other polarity, we're missing that defect level and we have to direct tunnel through the entire thickness. And again, once again, knowing these uh, band offsets here is critical to determining the built-in field and how this device will work. And that's where, uh, that's where these barrier heights come in. So the simplest theory, this should be very easy to predict. So here's the barrier height here. It's the offset between the Fermi level of the metal uh, and the uh, conduction band of the oxide. And it should be equal to the difference um, again, uh, between the, the uh, work function of the metal, which is the distance between the Fermi level to the vacuum and the electron affinity of the oxide. You basically take the difference and you get this blue here. Uh, a more sophisticated model, this doesn't always work out, so a more sophisticated model takes into account charge transfer at the interface between the metal and the uh, dielectric and the uh, induced interface traps that are induced by you know cutting off a metal with a high density of states and the band gap of a dielectric where there's a uh, essentially no density of states. And what happens there is that the, uh, the metal will develop an effective work function as the um, Fermi level of the metal is gonna be driven towards this charge neutral level in the dielectric. And so this charge neutral level is the point at which the, these interface traps, their character goes from uh, acceptor-like, or sorry, uh, donor-like in the bottom of the gap uh, to acceptor-like in the top of the gap. And for charge neutrality, this, uh, the energy level really wants to be here. And it wants to pin the Fermi level of the metal here. That's why you have a lot of trouble with uh, different metals on various uh, semiconductors and dielectrics. You try different metals and they don't seem to make a difference in the uh, barrier heights. And the reason for that, or way, way that's described is through the slope. So the Fermi level, or sorry, the effective work function of the metal is gonna be based on this vacuum work function and the, uh, uh, charge neutral level of the insulator. So charge neutral level of the insulator plus a slope times the uh, difference between the uh, uh, vacuum work function of the metal and the this charge neutral level of the insulator. So the slope parameter is just how the, vary, the barrier height varies with work function. If it varies a lot, uh, then S is equal to one. And this uh, ECNL, this orange term drops out and the um, effective work function is equal to the vacuum work function. If S is equal to zero, then the interface is pinned and the uh, effective work function is basically equal to the charge neutral level. And so typically it's somewhere in between. And um, 
however, that, those are very hard to predict. And often even the predictions in the more sophisticated model come out wrong. And the reason is there's uh, actual physical non-idealities in the device, such as interfacial dipoles. Uh, you get basically a charge at this interface between the metal and the dielectric, or you can have charge trapping in the dielectric, or even an interfacial oxide might form due to a chemical reaction between your dielectric and the metal. And all those can change uh, the barrier height slightly uh, as well. And so we need a way of measuring uh, the barrier heights. And often this is done with uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. But this is really more of an indirect technique where you infer the uh, barrier height from the valence band offsets. And I'll talk about that later on in the presentation. What we want to be able to do is measure uh, the barrier heights directly in a working device structure. And the only technique that can do that is internal photo emission. And so the way this technique works is you, um, here's our MIM device structure. So we got metal, insulator, metal, but we make our metal very thin. So it's optically transparent, just less than 10 nanometers or so. And then we bias that up, a stick it in the probe station, bias it up, and then we expose it to monochromatic light uh, through a xenon arc lamp. So, you know, fairly high energy light. And depending on the bias we apply, if we apply a uh, positive bias to our device, we can shine light so that it uh, energetically photo emits electrons from the, valence, from the uh, Fermi level of the metal into the conduction band of the oxide where we can detect the current that flows through this device. So since this is happening internally, this is called internal photo emission rather than something like the uh, photoelectric effect where you actually emit the electron into vacuum. So this barrier height would be lower than the, of course, the vacuum photoelectric effect. And if we apply a negative bias to the top electrode, notice the bands are tilting the opposite direction. We photo excite electrons from the top electrode into the connection band and we detect a current in the opposite direction. And so by measuring the uh, current yield, the square root of current yield versus the photon energy, as we uh, can pull, pull it off through this monochromator, uh, you know, we're sweeping up from one, two, three EV, and then the threshold occurs where we start detecting current. That's a function of bias. And so we take these threshold voltages uh, for photo emission, and then we plot those versus the square root of the electric field that was applied. And that helps us to account for Schottky barrier lowering. We then extrapolate those plots back to the uh, zero field and we get our zero field barrier heights. And so this is basically uh, how this is done. Uh, so far, there's actually been very few reports of IP on these MEM structures. All right, so let's go into the amorphous metals. What, how does this technique work on those? And actually, wh why do we want to look at amorphous metals? Well, the advantage is uh, typically um, MIM devices, especially these tunnel diodes, were severely limited by the polycrystal and metals they can deposit at the time. So you get this spiky metal. And because you're relying on tunneling, um, the electric field depends um, exponentially on the roughness of these devices. And so it'd be really hard to get good devices. By replacing this with a smooth uh, metal, you can get uniform control of the electric field and also low work function variation. So we're gonna look at two different uh, amorphous metals or actually three different ones. One, uh, the original one was zirconium, copper, aluminum, nickel. This is a metal that's been used for golf clubs and uh, those DSP displays and that sort of thing. It has a fairly low thermal stability, but it's very smooth. And then a more recently developed one by John Rager's group at uh, OSU uh, was uh, tantalum-based amorphous metals involving nickel and silicon or tungsten and silicon. They have a much higher thermal stability and potentially a higher work function. And that's where we come in to try to determine what, uh, what the effective work function is these materials are in various insulators. Okay, so um, the way we do this is we, uh, we got some uh, theoretical band diagrams based on uh, expected barrier heights from the simple Schottky model. And then we do our uh, internal photo emission measurements. Here we're looking at the top interface. You can see the lights hitting the uh, aluminum and photo injecting electrons into the hafnium oxide here or, or SiO2 or aluminum oxide. And here um, we're applying a positive bias and photo emitting electrons from the bottom electrode, the Z can is what we like to call it, into the uh, dielectric. And then we extrapolate back and we build band diagrams based on those. And notice they look a little bit different. Um, qualitatively, the slope is pointing in a different direction. So our built-in field is reversed for the SiO2 and for the hafnium oxide. And when we make electrical measurements, 
um, that actually makes a difference. So here's uh, IV curves, and this is the absolute value of current density is a log uh, plot of current versus uh, applied voltage here. And then the asymmetry, we just divide the negative current by the positive current. And we expect to see positive asymmetry for these devices. And you see aluminum still behaves like it's supposed to, the aluminum oxide. Uh, but both the um, haptium oxide and the SiO2 have unexpected asymmetry in, in the opposite direction. So the uh, positive current is actually greater than the negative current. And although that's unexpected based on the uh, predicted band diagrams, it's actually very consistent with the IP, which shows the opposite slope in the uh, built-in field. Uh, now uh, we place the tantalum oxide, or sorry, the Z-can with uh, tantalum tungsten silicon. Look at the same set of dielectrics. Again, look at the uh, top aluminum interface and the bottom uh, tau Z, we call it, uh, interface. And this time the band diagrams actually look fairly similar. Uh, the big difference, you know, the aluminum uh, barriers are once again near literature values predicted by IP or measured by IP, even though the prediction is a little bit different for, quite a bit different for hafnium oxide. Uh, qualitatively though, the built-in voltage, the slope is the same for all three. And when we do electrical measurements, we find that as we expect the symmetry is greater than one for uh, both the, uh, actually all three devices, and it's consistent with both the IP and the theory. So things don't always, um, aren't always completely different than predicted, but uh, you need, it's not always the same either. All right, comparing the two, uh, the aluminum barriers in all cases are roughly similar. So they're all about uh, uh, three EV for the uh, aluminum oxide, half team oxide, and larger about 3.8 EV for the SiO2. Uh, so that's a good sanity check that the aluminum barriers are the same across all the devices or consistent across all the devices. And, but what we see is that the tau -Z barriers are indeed bigger than the Z-CAN barriers. And so that's pretty exciting because that's what we were looking for, an amorphous metal that was more stable and had larger barriers than the Z-CAN. Um, one other thing is that the Z-CAN barriers were a little bit lower than expected for both the SiO2 and the aluminum oxide. And part of the reason for this, uh, I didn't mention that this Z-CAN, I did mention it's a little bit unstable, but it tended to form a uh, zirconium rich interfacial oxide uh, when we put a dielectric on top of it. And uh, some work by uh, Kita and Toriumi uh, showed that if you've got uh, oxides with different oxygen densities next to each other, you can form an internal dipole that will uh, change the barrier height, and it could be what's explained. It could explain these uh, barrier anomalies that we see in the Z-CAN. So, for example, if we had a positive dipole here, this would be an interfacial zirconium oxide and our, say, our aluminum oxide, that would shift our barrier uh, 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 Fermi level up a little bit, so we'd have a smaller barrier here on the uh, uh, on the top metal there. So. Let's go. Oh, uh, so I mentioned that the S parameter. And again, this just graphically illustrates if we've got uh, S is equal to zero, then the interface is completely pinned and our barrier height doesn't vary at all when we change metal. So, uh, you know, we, when we change metals, we change the work function. And sometimes that can have no impact. And if S equals one, it varies perfectly with the, with the metal. So looking at our two, uh, oxides here in our uh, three different uh, amorphous metals. Uh, we see that the slope for haftium oxide is about 0.56, whereas the slope for aluminum oxide is 0.9. And it's expected that we'd see more variation with the lower dielectric constant aluminum oxide than the haftium oxide, uh, because empirically, this uh, S parameter should depend on the uh, dielectric constant of the high frequency dielectric constant of the uh, insulator. And so this is actually fairly consistent with what's reported in the literature for both uh, hafnium oxide and aluminum for the S parameters. All right, one more thing we did was look at a different top electrode. So same bottom electrode that, uh, well, actually I've added some here, the tan, tanalum nitride, tau -Z, and tanalum nickel silicide, but now we've got gold on top. And so the uh, gold barrier heights are consistent, uh, same, about four plus or minus 0.1 EV, which is about our uh, error bars for our IP measurements. Uh, the um, bottom tantalum-based metal barrier, however, uh, we see that the 
nickel-based metal is uh, greater than has a greater work function of the uh, tungsten-based, which is greater than the tail nitride. This is actually consistent with the average sort of the average work function of the constituents. The nickel has a larger work function than the tungsten, and so all of these actually in turn have a larger work function than the, the Z can. Uh, looking at the um, uh, asymmetry again, this is IV curves. Uh, these are our symmetry curves. All of them show very similar asymmetry of uh, less than one, which is consistent with our IP measurements. A weird thing though, is if we compare the gold and aluminum top electrodes, uh, we find, first of all, the gold electrodes are about an EV larger than the uh, aluminum electrodes, which makes sense. They're the work, vacuum work function difference by, by about one EV. So that makes sense. But when we look at the bottom electrodes, we find that the tauty barriers to the gold devices are about 0.7 EV smaller than for the aluminum devices. And so that top electrode is somehow impacting the work function of the bottom electrode. And it's likely there's some been work by Shamulia that showed that you can get uh, diffusion of uh, uh, metals through your dielectric. Another work has shown that you can actually use this as an RAN. You get gold diffusing through your dielectric and it forms conductive filaments. Uh, but it's likely that some positive ions from the gold are floating down towards the uh, bottom electrode interface and reducing that barrier. You can imagine if there's positive charge here, you'd get uh, a drop here and an effective reduction of that barrier height. All right, to summarize the amorphous metal work, um, this is the first measurement of barrier heights for these amorphous metals. And uh, we found that the uh, tau -Z is a pretty good candidate. It's got a larger work function than the Z can. Uh, we can predict the barrier heights by, uh, uh, sorry, the IV properties with IPE. Uh, it's got low roughness um, and thermal stability above 600. So uh, we showed that this is a pretty promising candidate for uh, uh, for an electrode. And again, um, you know, John McGlone in Wager's lab was the one that uh, first developed this uh, metal, and uh, Melanie is the one that led the IPE measurements. Okay, moving on to um, ferroelectric hafnium oxide. So this is an interesting material. It was discovered in, just in 2011. Uh, these guys were uh, messing around in the lab and they found out they just happened to have a guy working on this that had worked uh, in ferroelectrics in the past instead of just dielectrics. And he noticed that he got this hysteresis loop um, when he uh, looked at uh, silicon doped hafnium oxide. And they decided that it was probably a metastable orthorhombic crystal structure, which is later confirmed. Uh, people have been able to uh, duplicate this with a variety of dopants, including zirconium, which we're going to look at here, uh, silicon, lanthanum, gadolinium, aluminum, and a bunch of other things. So, um, and a bunch of different electrodes as well. Uh, what's cool about this is that it's CMOS compatible. They're already using the hafnium oxide base guide gate dielectric. And so uh, it's not, uh, it's a fairly, I shouldn't say non-trivial, but it's a lot easier than trying to incorporate lead-based ferroelectrics into your uh, CMOS process. And so there's a lot of excitement about it, being able to incorporate this into a process and make uh, perhaps low power, negative differential capacitance sets. So uh, fast turn on, uh, erupt turn on devices, uh, non-volatile uh, ferroelectric based memories, and um, uh, as well as ferroelectric sets. That would, um, basically instant on computers and that sort of thing. So working with Sandia here, uh, my former student, Sean Smith at Sandia actually uh, made this hafnium zirconium oxide uh, using super cycles of ALD. So, you know, I told you, you have to go back and forth between your precursors for ALD. Here he interleaved uh, zirconium oxide and hafnium oxide. Uh, first, he had to carefully characterize the two different uh, growth processes individually, and then put them together in a super cycle to make this material. Uh, we looked at a variety of top electrodes. Uh, if you're going to incorporate in these devices, you want to know um, what would be the best electrode to use. And again, our uh, homemade IP system has an accuracy of plus or minus 0.1 EV. And we also compared with some XPS results taken at Sandia as well as NIST. And I'll talk about those in a bit. So I haven't showed too many of these yet, but this is a plot of uh, photocurrent yield versus photon energy. And this is typically what we plot for IPE, though we usually only go up to lower energies. But we noticed a kind of an anomaly up here where it was increasing. And so we swept all the way up to 6 EV, which is the limit of our system, actually about 5.8 or so EV. After that, it becomes hard to interpret. And this is our standard IPE signal. We see this onset of, uh, photo, of um, 
of uh, internal photo emission and current. But we saw another oops, abrupt increase at about 4.9 EV. And what that is likely due to is some sort of photo conduction. So instead of photo injecting electrons from the bottom electrode in the conduction band, we're actually exciting electrodes from the valence band of the dielectric into the conduction band. It basically um, uh, shining high enough energy light that we're making the dielectric photoconductive. Uh, the problem is this 4.9 EV uh, onset here is a bit small for the band gap of half dium oxide based materials. For example, zirconium oxide is about 5.4 EV, half dium oxide is a little bit larger, about 5.6 EV or so. And even uh, RF sputtered uh, zirconium doped half dium oxide is about 5.4 EV. And so the early onset that we see at 4.9 EV is, is suggestive that we've got some band tailing in this material uh, due to you know, defective uh, or low, low crystalline quality material, or maybe oxygen vacancy defects. And actually people have already shown that these are responsible for the wake up and fatigue in, the, in this material, the HZO we call it. Uh, and also we've shown in the past that there's broad defects in both the uh, half dium oxide and zirconium oxide when we look at reels. This was work done with a uh, former student this year in collaboration with Sean King at Intel. And people uh, have also detected these things with electron spin resonance. Uh, more recent work that came out as we were, uh, after we'd submitted this paper, uh, actually by a co-author, he'd done some uh, spectroscopic lipsometry on this material, and he did see an optical absorption due to defects at 4.9 EV with a slightly smaller band gap of about 5.2 EV. So it's very likely that this is due to some uh, defect level just below the conduction band here. So the, we get photo injection into those and then they, uh, because of the tailing there, they can easily make it into the electrons can make it to the conduction band and we get the conduction. Okay, so you're probably used to seeing these threshold voltage versus uh, square root electric field plots now. This is for the uh, top electrode here. You can see our uh, rainbow light here is hitting the uh, top electrode. And then uh, here we're um, applying uh, the opposite bias, a positive bias, and photo injecting from the bottom electrode. So top electrodes, we see a wide variety in uh, barrier heights here for uh, depending on whether we got tantalum, aluminum, tantalum, nitride, platinum, gold. Uh, this slope here actually is larger than what you'd expect from the um, uh, relative dielectric constant of the insulator. And that suggests that we've got some charge trapped in these oxides. And that'll come and be important in a bit. So here we're looking at, every one of these is tantalum nitride that we're looking at here, but the label here is the opposite electrode. So sometimes, you know, we have a gold, uh, aluminum, tantalum. And notice that the extrapolated barrier height of the tantalum nitride is different depending on what we have on top. And even if we've got tantalum nitride on top, uh, we get a slightly different barrier height. And that's just further affirmation that that top electrode can affect the uh, bottom electrode barrier height through some sort of uh, perhaps, you know, uh, remote oxygen scavenging or perhaps some sort of diffusion or something like that, but it does have an impact. And also the processing. Uh, here we're depositing a dielectric on the tantalum nitride and here we're depositing the tantalum nitride on the dielectric. So there's more possibility for some damage here of the underlying material. But anyways, it's more evidence that it's important to measure these barrier heights. So um, Sandy had some expertise in XPS and we also uh, collaborated with NIST and <clears throat> to, do, to get, get these uh, uh, valence band offsets with XPS, you need to use a series of samples. So three samples here. This is the classic paper on this where we're looking at silicon and germanium. So you got a thick sample of silicon, thick sample of germanium, and then when we've got a thin layer of one material on the other. And the idea is you measure um, the, uh, uh, the uh, valence band, sorry, the, uh, uh, the um, energy it takes to emit an electron from the uh, valence band, or sorry, keep screwing this, I'm not an XPS guy, but from the um, core levels uh, to the valence band of the germanium, and then the difference between the core levels of the germanium and the silicon, you add that, and then you subtract off the difference between the core level and the valence band of the silicon. And that gives you the valence band offset. So kind of an indirect method. You need three samples to do this. In our work, uh, we're using a thick sample of the HCO, half dim zirconium oxide, uh, a sample we've got a thin metal on top of the HCO, and then a sample we've got a thick uh, metal. So 
the XPX basically takes its information either just from the HCO, uh, just from the metal, or uh, from both materials. And then you follow this process and you can get an estimate of the valence band offset. So we do that. And the XPS results here are shown in orange. Uh, the IP results are shown in blue and for you know, the, all the different metals studied. Not every technique was performed on every metal. And so there's sometimes there's a band diagram missing. Uh, but what we found is in general, the uh, IP measurements are showing barrier heights of about uh, roughly an EV uh, lower, or sorry, um, higher than the uh, XPS. And this suggests some sort of charging in the dielectric that's not accounted for by the XPS, but it is accounted for by the IP. If we look at the uh, impact of the metal work function on the barrier height, we see that we see roughly the same slope uh, S parameter for both the IP and the XPS, uh, about 0.8 or so if you round to one significant figure. But you can see the obvious offset, the IP are, are larger. And also there's a smaller scatter in the IP data than the XPS. And again, the uh, reason for this is you got this three sample method and there's also, you're not accounting uh, for, for any charging that takes place. And so the um, IP measurements are a more accurate measure of the uh, band offsets. And so uh, to, to fi summarize, finally, the uh, first direct measurements, not only of the amorphous metals, but uh, of uh, half zirconium oxide barrier heights using IP. Um, we compared it with XPS uh, measurements. And we see the rate, roughly the same dependence of, of uh, barrier height on work function. I mean, you can use different metals to get different device performance with this material. Uh, let's see. Uh, so not only uh, might there be charging, but uh, some of the active metals like aluminum and titanium were, were bigger outliers for both techniques. And that suggests there could be interfacial layer formation. Those metals are very reactive and you might get a little bit of aluminum oxide or tie oxide at the interface. Uh, the fact that the, although we can tune the barriers with different metals, the fact that they vary from <coughs> uh, theory uh, is another indication that the direct measurement using the IP is very useful for understanding device behavior. All right, a uh, lot of material there, uh, but uh, that's, that's it for today. Thanks for your attention. And this is uh, my group from a few years ago. Uh, Melanie here uh, is the one that did all the uh, IP measurements. Uh, Sean, who looks like a giant because of the way this picture was taken, was the guy at Sandia that deposited the uh, HCO. And uh, Dustin uh, also uh, contributed a lot of work here as well as uh, Connor over here. All right, thank you. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, so, so we we do have time for questions for whoever uh, has some. You could enter them in chat or just uh, unmute and and ask. Um, you know, I I do have a question or two as well. So, I'll give you a second. But uh, yes. Yeah, so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Um, what do you see a viable commercial product using this? Uh, um, research uh, for the uh, which aspect the IPE or the uh, devices the devices <laughs> uh, so one of the um, the commercial products so we've had funding from guys like on semiconductor to look at uh, capacitors and they were interested in the band offsets uh, uh, applied materials is very interested in the band offsets in these materials they're actually working on setting up a system down in California to do this as well uh, so, you know, capacitors is a basic thing. Uh, using these um, uh, metals as gates for transistors, uh, inserting thin, uh, I didn't talk about this, but if you insert, a, well, we sort of talked about this. If you've got an interfacial layer that can change the barrier height, well, people have realized that and now they're intentionally putting interfacial oxides to try to uh, engineer the barrier height that they want. Uh, for the min diodes themselves, uh, we had a lot of interest from uh, Red Wave Energy down here. I uh, was interested in building uh, uh, infrared uh, waste energy harvesting uh, using these high-speed MIM diodes. So a lot of different applications of this simple structure. Also, um, uh, RAM memory. Um, we worked on that a little bit in the past. And I didn't talk about that work, but that's starting to become very interesting for neuromorphic applications and for the memory companies to make high-density uh, 3D memories. So there's just a few of the uh, possibilities. 
Yes. Do we have uh, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I do. It's uh, John Leaven here. Uh, thanks, John, for a great talk. Um, have have people considered trying to make like um, quantum devices, like quantum cascade lasers, using ALD, um, or like quasi or like super lattices or something like that, which are normally done with um, molecular beam epitaxy? That's a very good question. And although a, a ALD, atomic layer deposition, was originally called atomic layer epitaxy, you know, 50 years ago, it actually is pretty difficult to uh, epitaxially deposit films with ALD because it's typically done at low temperatures around at 200 plus or minus 50 degrees or so. I think there is some work uh, where people are trying to do that. But again, you know, something like MBE is, is better at depositing epitaxial materials. Uh, but the thicknesses are about the of uh, where uh, ALD could be useful. Got that. Okay. Thank you. Hey, John. Uh, just a question. Can you talk, uh, talk a little bit more about the mean diode for the energy house, uh, harvest? Uh, sure. Let me uh, let's see if I can get out of my presentation mode here. Um, show. I don't have a whole, I don't have any backup slides here, unfortunately, but um, let me get to the, uh... so the idea is that the, uh, you, you make these antennas that are sensitive to infrared radiation, these bow tie antennas, and then they transfer the signal to this diode, but you need a really high frequency diode to, to be able to rectify this current. So a standard uh, PN diode or even a Schottky diode are considered to be not fast enough to do this. Uh, you know, there's a, I've got other slides, unfortunately, not with me that show that there's a ton of energy that's available uh, for industrial waste energy, or even energy that's re irradiated uh, off the earth at nighttime into space that could be uh, uh, harvested with this. Right now, um, probably the major research challenge with these is uh, getting a MIM diode that will give you strong asymmetry at very low bias and strong, uh, strong rectification at low bias. And that is probably the bottleneck right now. Um, getting below a tenth of a volt, uh, say uh, ten, even just 10 to one asymmetry uh, and a response, uh, I can't remember what exactly what the responsivity was, but that would be enough. But uh, Red Wave Energy is a company that's been, it's got some funding from uh, RPE and some other places to work on this. And we, we were consulting with them for a while, but then um, the whole company restructured. And it's been a while since we've talked to those guys. So material use normally can be what kind of materials? Uh, so um, uh, typically you want low work function metals. Uh, sometimes, um, so there's interest in low work function metals and also uh, low band gap oxides. So, uh, you know, the lower those barrier heights are, the lar larger the tunnel current can be and uh, the lower the turn on voltage. Uh, if you make them too small, though, and they become dominated by thermal emission, a uh, Schottky emission uh, um, over over the uh, over the barrier, and so you've got to have just right um, kind of just just right the material system. Um, some of the dual dielectric uh, barriers that we come up with are also of interest uh, to these companies. Uh, putting together things like uh, nickel nickel oxide, uh, tantalum oxide and uh, are, are some of the materials. It's, again, it's been a while since we've talked to those guys. So I'm not sure what material systems they're focused on at present. Thank you, very interesting. Like you mentioned this uh, layer, these tiny thin layers are actually pinhole free. How do you actually characterize that they are really pinhole free? So um, we have not done a lot of this work, but there's other groups that um, you can uh, deposit films, uh, you know, deposit this calcium film basically that's very sensitive to moisture and then coat it with a very thin layer of uh, ALD material. Or, you know, there's been a lot of research where they'll, they'll do uh, nanolaminates or uh, different things to try to increase the uh, efficacy of the diffusion barrier. And they can measure how long it takes to, uh, basically discolor the, the calcium. So there's ways that you can, um, uh, you can actually measure this. Uh, but the fact that we see, so the devices we're making, we're not making very small devices. We're making these large devices with uh, 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 500 micron or say 100 micron dots. Uh, 
the fact that those work for these very thin films indicates that we've got a very uniform defect-free film. You know, we get a very good repeatability across the wafer. Whereas if, uh, if we had a lot of defects, then every device would look different. And if, for very large devices, it probably wouldn't work at all due to Poisson statistics. So, um, you know, these films for, for a given technique at the same, a different technique, say at the same temperature, ALD tends to provide higher quality films because of the self-limiting nature of those chemical reactions. You know, they want to fill up every reactive spot and then they don't uh, continue after that. And so, you know, you get very uniform buildup of a film. Uh, any other questions? I, I do have one. So, so you've talked about some of the applications, but I was kind of curious. Uh, it, it seemed like uh, every now and then you were pointing out differences from the theoretical predictions you know, compared to what you see. And so, so in, in either this work or some of your other work, do you, do you run across situations where like your experimental results depart from theory in a way that make it look like there's a fundamental gap in the theory versus just not having the right measurements? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, there's definitely, uh, even the more sophisticated uh, uh, induced gap uh, theory um, that's on one of these slides um, is not is still still hotly debated. I had a, a guy uh, very old professor down at the University of Arizona that took me aside a couple of years ago and said, you know, all that stuff is completely wrong. And I'll tell you, <laughs> he's wrote an entire book on why it's all wrong. So he doesn't believe any of this stuff. So yeah, I guess the, this theory is still, um, is still not completely accepted. And these charge neutral levels are actually very difficult to calculate. There's a few groups in the world that try to calculate these based on first principles. And they typically don't um, satisfactorily predict what the, what the measurements end up being. So I guess yeah, there, there is a gap in the, in the theory there. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think we've uh, yeah we've reached the time uh, that we we advertise that the sends out. So yeah, thanks a lot, John. That was a that was a great talk, really interesting. And uh, all right, thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>